Hello and welcome to the comment response video. Now, for the 19th century cruisers. Now, because I've had some very interesting points in the past made by people who've gone, hang on, what you're saying does not accord with the slides that are going on next to you. Let me explain something at the beginning. These are the slides from the videos. They are there as, because frankly, otherwise I have a load of dead space next to me and this is just me talking and it's, they're sometimes there be useful for illustrating the questions and the response to the, co the comments. But as a rule, they're there really to just provide you something interesting to look at while I'm talking and answering your questions. So I hope that's all good. Right then. So let's start off with the very, very first of the videos. The introduction to unprotected, protected and armoured cruisers. And I rather enjoyed this video and I rather enjoyed the comments that responded to, from it. Um, there was David Brennan's, I do love protected cruiser. Well, you can see them. There was Marcus Franconian. On the industrial stuff of the Romans Water Mills Act, the Greeks actually had a novelty early steam turbine 2,000 to 2,500 years ago. Simplistic, but proved it could work a, a, a copper ball filled with water, two tubes over a fire, and it would rotate till the water was gone. Mm. The 11th century windmills started to make an appearance in Europe. They became real monsters in production, with the Dutch even building giant pumps, mm, 60 meters cubed a minute. Saw mills that could ram multiple tree trunks through the mill at one meter an hour, cutting them into multiple planks. It's the sad story of engineering that most are deemed old and obsolete, steam old-fashioned, windmills obsolete, water power obsolete, and yet everything we have now uses all these. Nuclear power plants, steam powered, true. Windmills are now powering generators. Hydropower, all can be traced back to ancient times. Even now, technologies of the 1800s are only just becoming viable. As a rule, humanity gets better at doing the things it already does as it gets more technology. It's not always the case that it necessarily invents something brand new. And yes, this was the ship that won, seemed to win the award from all of you of the most interesting name of what I was looking at. I was surprised. I thought General Admiral was going to get that award, but no. And what I'm going to say is I'm going to do this is going to be about an hour long. Okay. It's going to be about an hour long. I might not get through all the videos and all the comments, in which case I will do another one. Also about an hour long. But I think more than an hour of me responding to comments would be probably pretty boring in one sitting. Amelia Barrett, could someone coat a first class line of battleships to be ironclad or would it be too expensive? Very expensive, sadly enough, although it was considered. They were usually razzed first, a razzied first as Paul from Chicago pointed out, but it was still quite expensive to do. And they sort of looked into it and then went, mm we want to. Michael Cooch. Hello. Uh, the question, it depends what you mean by unprotected, because even the unarmoured cruisers had some degree of protection built in. Ooh, yeah, there's multiple levels of protected cruiser, for starters, and sometimes they're classified as unarmoured or unprotected, and they'd also be classified as third class protected. So it gets interesting. Iron constructors position coal bunkers to protect the vitals, using a rule of thumb of two feet of coal equals one inch of steel. Uh, yes, as long as you have coal in there, of course. Once you've used coal, which on a distant station you might have done, um, then you have a load of air between you and the outside, and that really doesn't have the impact. Coal as protection is a lovely thing to consider a barrier, as long as you, of course, have the coal there. It can actually get worse when you have an empty coal bunker and you have coal dust in there, because that, of course, can do wondrous things about making the explosion worse. So it's a kind of interesting scenario. Additionally, when a bunker floods, the coal within reduces the effect of flooding. On average, coal occupies 5 8 of the volume, leaving only 3 eighths of the volume that can be filled by water. This limits the loss of stability due to flooding, improving the survival of the ship, again, of course, requiring that the coal bunker is full. It's a lovely design idea on in, in theory. It's one of those things which is great in theory. In practice, ship's captains were loath to rely on coal as their armour because the coal might not be there and they were using the coal for other things. 
As to whether I'd build them, it depends on the roles I see my navy playing and where it's going to play. Who the likely opponent is? If I'm expecting the fleet battles against a peer opponent, then probably no. But if I'm looking at policing role, anti-pirate or slavery, patrols, presence, trying to flag in a benign environment, colonial policing somewhere, I'm unlikely to come up against heavy opposition, then they're worth considering, especially if cost means I can afford more of them. Three unarmored cruisers means I can guarantee one being available on station at all times. Two protected cruisers at the same time, the same cost could mean that both are unavailable, repair refit when they're needed. It's not all about war fighting. On the day, the wider strategic context needs to be considered too. Which sometimes explain why suboptimal ships are built deployed. Yep. Amend them. Some of the Amon um, um, ships, i.e. the Dotterall class, all built between 1878 to 80, were only about the size of a 1930 sloop and performed much the same roles. Yeah, and... Basically, there are issues in that you are making the wise choice. You're saying, you know, you can have unprotected ships. You need a combination of all three. More than likely, if you're a major power like Britain. If you're a smaller power, it's going to be interesting what exactly you're going to need. What exactly you're going to need is going to be debatable. What exactly you're going to need and what exactly you want is going to be debatable. It's, it's about achieving a balance. It is about achieving a balance. And sorry, if there's a weird timing issue there and things change, it's because there was a <clears throat> small issue with the recording. But no. Mm, Alright, so. Uh, Michael Hooch, uh, 19 minutes in, the schematic of a protected cruiser versus an armor cruiser. Being colorblind, I find it difficult to make out the red lines. If you're doing future schematics and you could find enough way, different color, cross-arching, whatever, show things, I'd appreciate it. I have to admit, they were the best I found. Um, this laptop, I love it, but I am very happy as soon as, well, hopefully by the point that this goes up, the paychecks, etc., which we're due in, have arrived. So therefore, I have enough in my account that I can afford to exist for the remainder of the month, and therefore I can use the money I've set aside for the computer to procure the computer, because I'm not blaming my tools. This is a very good laptop, but there is limitations to what you can do on a laptop. And the thing is, my skills are only so good. And I'm now pushing this to the edge of what my skills can do on the circumstance of this laptop. I need a tower unit back working, and that's what I'm planning on building. <sighs> History Paul. Hello. Back in my day, all we needed were plenty of trees, a couple of third rates to defeat the French, dang kids for their steam-powered cruisers and rifling. What not? Rabble, rabble, angry fish shake. Yeah, that, that was probably a fair number of people like that. Daniel Freeman. Unprotected cruisers. Slightly faster sloops. Longer range destroyers before you have destroyers. Assuming I'm the RN of global commitments, a priority to protect the med as the author, main artery of the empire. Uh, you, always, you never fail to show that you're a doctor, do you, Dan? I like it. And some annoyingly close potential adversaries. France, Germany, generally Europe. Hmm, never forget America. Potentially Russia. Everywhere. Cruiser force of 60% unprotected crews to guard against and be able to overwhelm armed auxiliaries and aim to gang up on larger threats. These can also do the president's mission on the cheapest budget. 30% protected cruisers to support the unprotected cruisers and overmatch anything in distant waters. I hope that doesn't need a fleet. 10% armor cruisers. Cheaper to send out than battleships. Why do people call them pre-dreadnoughts? What's the dreadnought at this point? I agree. And because there is a chance that the smoke coming over the horizon when they see someone coming to support the unprotected cruiser that they are beating up or thinking of beating up will be one of those who will make your uh, you graduate the decision. This is a pre-radio of, uh, pre of any reliability and so in a war setting the unprotected cruisers could offer communication links for repeating signals and extending search grids. You blockade runners because I'm the RN. If I'm fighting you, I'm blockading you or the enemy fleet for my own fleet. That pretty much works. That does work. I would add, and this is something personal, I know, that if you're building such a force and you are aiming such a force, you are adding it in a level of capability, which is pretty darn useful. There is always a point in presence, and I've discussed this before, when you have ships on presence on a station, there is the ship itself and its capabilities, but what also there is the fact of what it represents. I.e., currently, if we look at current affairs, 
Britain has some river class OPVs sitting in the Far East. Saying hello, doing, well, not fishery protection, but maritime security support and presence. They're there for disaster relief and all these things. That's lovely. They, of course, represent pretty much zero in terms of military capability for any kind of peer conflict. I am sorry if this has upsets anyone, but if you really want to take a river class into a peer conflict, please remember to offer yourself as the commander of it and take only a crew of volunteers. And when I say volunteers, I don't want anyone with actual training who I actually can need for things to volunteer. Um, you can take a volunteer from... volunteers from... You can do a Dirty Dozen style operation if you want, for all I care. Uh, they're lovely ships, but they're not what I would take into a war. That's not their role, and it shouldn't be. But the thing is, when they turn up, you see them, and, they get, and they're going lovely. But you also know that if they can reach you, then a Type 23 can get to you, and a Type 45 can get to you. And behind them, of course, there's our friendly Queen Elizabeth and Prince of Wales going, Hello. So you were nice to my little friend, weren't you? Because if you weren't, I will get upset with you. And that is the whole point. And it's very nicely structured, so you've put that through. I would probably change it a little bit. I probably going fifty percent of budget on unprotected cruisers because I'm going to be able. Well, no, actually, that would be this way. I would be spending thirty percent of my budget on unprotected cruisers, which would probably build me a lot of ships. Thirty percent of my budget on protected cruisers, and thirty percent on armored cruisers. And if you consider the cost ratios between those ships, I would probably end up with a force of. Uh, 15, 30, and possibly 55% in terms of numbers. Of ships. So slightly more armoured cruisers than you have. But the reasoning for that is pretty much a ratio of what I need operational versus what I want in reserve status. And that's the other thing. I would have to admit that of my protected cruisers and armoured cruisers, I would probably have a maximum of a third actually in commission at any one point. The rest I'd have in ordinary to save them for any war I needed. The prote unprotected cruisers I'd be quite happily running into the ground. Therefore my peacetime and presence missions and keeping my crews trained and qualified and then in wartime or the moment things start looking at all edgy I'll start shifting them around. That's what you do. Well, from Chicago. Would I build unprotected cruisers? Absolutely. Anti-slavery, blackbirding, patrol vessels, revenue covers, colonial station ships, longer range, anti-piracy, lots of important jobs, 100% are useful. I wouldn't build big ones. If I could choose between a 4,000 ton unprotected cruiser and a 3,000 ton protected cruiser, I do protect it. But 1,000 ton unprotected cruisers, yes please. Exactly. It's basically, it's the sloop roll, before you call them sloops. It's third class cruiser. Uh, Christopher, I think a purpose-built unprotected cruiser is a far better choice for most nations to do than the armed merchant cruiser. Yeah. A ship taken up from trade cannot participate in the economy in wartime. One unprotected cruiser, due to their lower cost, smaller size, and no specialized construction, versus a protected or armored cruiser, can be used by a clever government to stimulate the economy in peacetime. An additional small unprotected cruiser, or two a year, can be easily added to the budget, and would find much favor with and support from mercantile interests, if justified as being for the expression of pirates and colonial and foreign waters in times of peace and trade protection in time of war. And careful selection of yards to build these ships can be used to help support additional yards domestically, capable of building smaller warships, or as part of a general scheme to improve the industrial and economic capacity of the strategically placed colonies, adding to their value. A yard capable of building a cruiser can refit or repair one as well. The use of liners as AMCs is not viable as the British found due to their exceptionally high operating costs. <laughs> oh, good God. I, I think there were Admiralty accountants who had 
panic attacks when seeing the cost of fueling these ships. Um, Wayne's World. Hello, Wayne. Of course, Commerce Raiding Fair. Are fast enough to run stronger opponents, but more than that. Fast enough to run from stronger opponents, but more than enough to disrupt trade. That's the trouble with unprotected cruisers. Often they weren't fast. That's the thing. In an ideal world, you would give them speed to make up for their lack of armor. But in a real world, they tended to not want to spend much on them at all. If they weren't giving them armor or any protection at all, they didn't want to give them any put much money into their engines. So they tended to be slow as well as unprotected, which basically is code for in wartime, sitting duck. Um, think about that. Slow and unprotected. Calvin Gasberg, for my part, building the SMS Zara and her sisters made sense, except they weren't good in sea keeping. Maybe even without the 0.75 inch deck armor and half the torpedo tubes, but with second, a few second class torpedo boats, they would have been more successful. Hmm. Come on, Karen. Would the design principles of the armor to protect your cruisers be the genesis of the differential between a battleship and a cruiser, i.e., slow, fat, wide, well armored versus low, narrow, uh, low armor, narrow, quick? Um. That's the point out there. Battleships this time, well, interesting creatures to be sure, they were defined as battleships. In fact, one of the classes to be discussed treads the fine line between the second class battleship and armored cruisers rather more finely than a certain USN vessel of the time did. Um, I'm, of course, referring to the vessel which sadly was sunk at the beginning of the Spanish American War. Well, before, as a, before the Spanish American War sank due to an accident. I know what the Americans claim to justify the Spanish-American War, but let's be honest, Maine probably went down to an accident. Um, Makuch, some of the armoured crews of the time used to be battleships. Atreus Warrior and Black Prince started life as top of the naval food chain, but time passed and world moved on, and both were eventually reclassified as armoured cruisers. Sometimes the difference between a battleship and an armoured cruiser carried a whim of Bureau Cat and the stroke of a pen. Um, not... Okay, let me explain something. Warrior and Black Prince were never battleships. They were called frigates. Yes, they're basically... The trouble is the frigate at that point then becomes codicil for the first rate ship of the line battleship, which is why you then develop things called cruisers, because frigates are these massive things. But they're not calling them... Saying they're reclassified from battleships to armored cruisers is a stretch. Classified from frigates... And armoured frigates to armoured cruisers, yes. But by the time they do that, they've also changed what a battleship is. And the battleship has been renewed, and is, an, is there, there is a new thing. And the, basically, I would say the thing is with Warrior and Black Prince is they start off as, when they enter the service, they are, the Ironclad Age has arrived. We have this armour, we have these guns, we have engines, we have all this. And you have this sort of focus point, and then from there dives off the strands, which will become the armoured cruiser, the protected cruiser, the unprotected cruiser, and the battleship. And they sort of straddle them, straddle them all. And as a result, they sort of do sit in the armoured protected cruiser world. that Because they sit in the middle of that. So... Yeah. No. Um, and yes, I can see where you're coming from, uh, but I wouldn't agree with that as an example. And I wouldn't say it's just the whim of a bureaucrat and stroke of a pen, because they're reclassified by the Sea Lords. And at that time, the Sea Lords are very much no bureaucrats. They are many things. They are nuts. They have absolutely... Of the strangest idea of where the world is going and how you build a navy and how you crew a navy. But they're not bureaucrats. They are many, many things. They have incredibly interesting personalities and are probably likely to physically bite people's hands off if they annoy them too much, uh, if that person happens to be French. But leaving that to one side and they're perhaps disturbingly high levels of aggression considering they don't actually fight, haven't actually fought the French in uh, quite a long time uh, when they actually are in charge um, then they're not bureaucrats there are there are some very sensible ones there are some good ones it's just 
there are some who are yeah someday i will do a series about the, the various sea lords of the navy in their roles i will do that as a series but that will be a few years away after i have managed to publish and uh, complete and publish my book which i want to work on on the third sea lord Mark Cant email. Mark Cant email. Hello, I'm. That's your name on here. I, I'm. I'm presuming the email's not supposed to be there, because I'm presuming that's not your surname. I'm presuming it's just added on there. Uh, we have a naval rifle from the unprotected cruiser Castilla as a trophy cannon in Highland Park, 1898. Battle. Cool. Alex Hunt. It's worth noting that the earliest industrial processes in the UK were water-driven cotton looms, blade grinders, and so on. Yes. Uh, Ricardo Karski, uh, the Ruska, a fast for effort. Every time I say Wooshtasha, I understand pronunciation is hard. Yes. Pronunciation is hard, and I am terrible at it. Right, and how long have we got? We've, we're at 20 minute marks, so I hopefully will get through at least another one, if not another two. There were 13 videos, I think, in this series, roughly. There are, there were more planned at one point. There was 18 ships fleshed out since ideas and then there was a case of how long am I wait for I'll do the best ones um in HMS Inconstant we're on to that episode video now um Paul from Chicago hang on yeah yeah on to that Inconstant first Although lost to history as a result of German bombing World War II I have it on good authority that the original name Inconstant came from a captured French ship during the battle, the captain lost control of himself. After the battle, the ship was brought into service. No. No, I, I think that was a wind-up. I, I think that's a wind-up com uh, comment. Paul, I will read it out, but that is a wind-up comment. After the battle, the ship was brought into service as HMS Incontinent on the North East India Station. But uh, when the name was reported out, a judicious flying clerk amended the ship's name to something a bit more appropriate. No, I'm I'm fairly sure it's just the Royal Navy looking in the New English Dictionary at this point. Felix B, question, who came up with the, uh, such staff names? Um, Royal Navy Naming Committee, Ship's Naming Committee. One of the most powerful, august, and I interesting organizations known to mankind. Again, that would be, to do their history would not be a book. It would be an entire, it would be a 21-volume 21, uh, 21 series. Um, again... Perhaps as a Kindle book in time, I will actually write it. Or I will find someone who I can suitably impress with the idea of writing it, because it will be a lifetime's work. Hello? Hello. Joined by a fluffy research assistant, or rather, the assistant fluffy research assistant. Now, I would just like to add, because a couple of people have commented this, I do not bring the dogs in for gratuitous things. They're usually with me. This one's just come down to visit me and try and drop off a, a battered sausage for me to eat. Very, very kind of him. I'm surprised he didn't eat it on the way down. But it's, you know, part of my history and lifestyle and the fact that I spend most of my life actually with books and archive materials that I usually have dogs as the sort of breathing companion of me most of the times and keep me sane. So if you see them in the videos, usually they're there for my company, rather than just gratuitous votes. Although, if anyone does want to subscribe just because I have this, well, I am still trying to get to 10,000 so that my mum can win the bet with my aunt by Christmas. Again, I don't know why she keeps making the same bet. I do not know, but it happens. Anyway, I'm going to let him go back and hopefully get his own dinner as a reward for bringing me the sausage. So, um, yeah, it was the Ship Design Committee, an august body. These, uh, Jeffrey Plum, these ships uh, define eggshells armed with hammers. No wonder in combat one danced around something with firepower. Luckily, the accuracy was not that great. However, they usually ended up closing to quite close range to try and hit each other, which meant that you were even more likely to get overwhelmingly blasted. But Marcus Franconium, I do love the era, uh, this era of ship designs. 1960s to 1899, uh, I think it's 1860s to 1899, some wonderful awkward designs. Definitely something interesting. 
Uh, Calm goes with Colombia during the Civil Year Civil War with coal and nickel and across two oceans. Seems a good candidate, but only for a short time until the Monroe Doctrine uh, kicks back in effect. Hmm. Chris, do you think that an effective sailing ring is of more value to an unprotected cruiser vis-a-vis an otherwise similarly designed and outfitted protected cruiser? Uh, if so, is this more dual role in operating environment or the relative vulnerability of the machinery due to the absence of an armored deck? I would say it changes. The sailing rig decreases in value the further along you get in terms of the quality of engineering. The more reliable the engines are, the more reliable coal is capable, the more reliable, uh, reliable you are able to access coal um, around the world, the less and less value the sailing rig has. The more and more it becomes something which actually hampers ship operations. Because you can't really have a turreted ship, you can't really have all the improvements you do with uh, firepower and weaponry if you rely upon sailing rigs because here is the thing you ever look at a ship and the way it's designed the first thing they work out is the power plant you decide roughly what you're gonna build you probably come up with the shape of a hull you work out what kind of power you need to get from that hole to move it. And then that goes in first. And on a modern ship, that means all the electronics, cabling, piping, everything, tubing for the engines goes in first. Long, long before you get to plumbing for human needs, or even electronics for equipment, that goes in first. The engines first. So, if you're designing a ship with a sailing rig, that's going to take priority over everything else. Once you've worked out the sailing rig, boom, 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 this is where we need to have these things. We have engines, boom, in there. Then we need to have a sailing rig fit around the engines. And then we fit everything else around those things. It gets complicated. My Griffin, every time you say incontinent, I hear incontinent. Probably re renamed, uh, renamed by a weak bladdered admiral. <laughs> David Nelson, do not name a ship during a night of drinking. Mm. Wayne to other science and technology. Um, 1955? I'd like to steal a TARDIS and go back to kick the <clears throat> person who didn't turn her into a museum ship in the Grand Sailing of Steel Toe Boots. <laughs> I can understand. Compliment 600. How many in the engine room? quite a lot. Um, there is a debate on this number. This, uh, hmm, this would probably be a stupidly hard project, but would you consider doing a video on Lord Fisher's rationalisation, specifically about the ships in the service that were scrapped? Who were they including? Base, uh, uh, they including basic specifications, why that ship was chosen for scrapping at the time, what it was replaced with, including basic specs, and why that ship was built up to the Dreadnought design revolution. Um... It would be an interesting project to do. It would be quite a big project to do. So I'll think about it. <coughs> they run no gags on any of us. I try to be honest with him constantly. At 5,000 tons, these ships are entirely too expensive for the benefit they bring. But during time period, if I was Admiral, that is exactly what I'd be for the hang my flag. These ships have free board. Something of, uh, of ships in the Mediterranean squadron lacked. Take one look at Adrian's hood and figure out where the Admiral's going to sleep. What about the Admiral's staff? Shift the flag gear for war occurs, but otherwise go to a ship with freeboard to avoid pneumonia, rickets, typhoid fever, and all the other stuff that I'm sure was making its way around the Mediterranean squadron. Hmm, probably true. What you got? Laws of grandparents. If I recall correctly, the French tore up a 74 in the mid-50s. Could you imagine how amazing if a 74 had been preserved? It would be amazing. It's one of those things that we use the law of grandparents, but that mainly seems to be about things which happen to do with World War II. Once you go back further than that, people become far less inclined to keep the stuff. And I don't know why, but, well, I do. It costs money, and they're always looking for the new thing and the future. So maybe we've become more 
retrospective. But I don't think so, because one of the interesting things in history, one of the interesting things that always occurs, are people writing, it was in my grandfather or great-grandfather's period that men were men, women were women, war was fought honorably, everyone was brave and glorious, and da-da-da-da-da. You can find writings from Anglo-Saxon times, which have that in, let alone medieval times. I'm fairly certain, I'm trying to remember, but there is a there was a book I read when I was first learning Latin at primary school, which I'm fairly certain was basically of that vein. And it was written about the same time as Julius Caesar was writing his dispatches from the uh, from France so yeah well this is dispatches from Ghoul, of course isn't it? as he called them but now uh, yeah it's um it's a vein of humanity it's got stronger perhaps the need to have something tactile to touch, to reconnect with, has grown. Or maybe it's because of America. There is part of me which, and please listen to South the French. America, because they sort of started later, have, especially since achieving power, they just have been more keen to preserve history of their past, I guess. To preserve their history, to show their history, what history they do have. And that's rubbed off on the rest of the world. And I like that. Maybe. That's that's a potentiality. It, it, there's lots of potential reasons, but the, uh, it would be nice. There are lots of ships which almost made it, but didn't quite. Rule Bretagne. Now, I live near a steam engine with similar horsepower and only one boiler, albeit 70 years newer and, and in the Marasca. Hmm. Vision. I disagree that the American fast cruisers were beautifully flawed or terrible. In fact, two were terrible, one mediocre, two pretty good, and two unlaunched. Scrapped on the stocks. I have a copy of Donald L. Kearney's The Old Steam Navy, Volume 1. Frigate, Sloops, and Gunboats, 1815-1855. Uh, the NIP, 1990. And it's very detailed about design, construction, and sea trials of these big wooden cruisers, authorized during the US Civil War, but completed several years after the war ended. Uh, the reputation of the most successful of these ships, USS Wang Penog, uh, was has been tarnished by poor results of the other ships, and the political infighting of the US Navy of the time between various genius engineers and their fanboys, and between established traditionists, line officers, and the upstart modernizing and engineering officers. These rival cliques expanded their fights to British engineering journals, Leading the poison views of Wang Penang in the that country. Most of the views of the British of Wang Penang were formed because by ships on the North American West Indies station, who were operating sailing alongside us. But we've got one side. In response to the threat of British invention in the Civil War, the US Navy constructed seven fast cruisers with several different engine and the hull designs. With the private design and built Idaho and Chattanooga being attack failures and not being fast at all while burning lots of coal, John Erickson's Madawaska not being not that fast, while Benjamin Isherwood's Wampanoag with an identical hull was fast, the only design to meet the Navy's requirements. It sits of the ship, the Amunusak, also being a very fast steamer on trials. Two more Wampang ships were never launched, broken up on the stocks. Both Wampang and Azusak reached 70 knots. I'm absolutely mispronouncing their names, but I've never, I've heard Wampangs before a long, long time ago. Azusak, I have to say, I haven't heard before. I've heard she had a sister, which was had a different engine, but I didn't hear the name. Well, I've never heard it pronounced. I think I've read it a couple of times before, but leave that one side. Um, reached 70 knots for a run of several times and tens of miles at the US East Coast several trials, whilst also proving to be economically steamers and good on sale. For the amount of coal consumed hourly per indicator horsepower, Wang Pong had the last of any steamships in the fleet. 
750 tons of it in her bunkers. The ship could uh, level knots under half of oil of steam over 4,000 miles over 16 days. More than enough to cross the Atlantic under steam between New York and Southampton. Also greater than 2,700 nautical miles at 10 knots of H. Ruskin and Constant. The Royal Navy's response to the issue would fast cruise. Hmm. Honestly, the Inconstant is one response. They get better. Armstrong had two major flaws. The first involvement in storage of supplies for a 375 crew, with her captain stating she could only carry enough bread for 65 days, and other supplies for 45 days. Alzheimer, in a dissenting inspection report, stated that, based on physical measurements, supplies for up to six months could be stowed within the hull. A far bigger flaw was that the ship could not accommodate her entire crew, with some of the crew being housed in accommodation ships of Brooklyn Navy Yard between her sea trials. A solution to this was the recommendation by Captain Sir Rogers in later survey inspection reports that a light spar deck be installed between the raised forecastle and the castle, converting Wampanoag to a flush deck covered battery cruiser. This would greatly increase the internal space of the ship without adversely affecting her speed, and indeed many of the naval Civil War era sloop wars would have their battery decks covered in the 1870s. Hmm. It's a nice, long, well put together argument you put forward. And I do like that from Bridget Bridgestone. I would say that if they had built all four, the world could have been slightly different. I would say if they'd done the modifications, the world could have been slightly different. I would also say that they still had problems. Benjamin Ishamwood, to call him controversial, I have discussed him in other videos, but he does go on to produce other ships. And he does go on to set an example which successor officers do manage to produce that role, but he is not the best in the role. He is capable chief engineer, but he's also not the best when it comes at politics. And that's why he doesn't get the funding. This is sort of the interesting in comparison when we get to the Columbia class. Because then there is a chief engineer who is good at politics and who can get the funding. And you see the difference. They are both genius engineers. They are both have notable followings. They are both very status. But one is good at playing the political game, and one is good. At, one is good at being a sledgehammer when there's a war on, and cannot adjust to the fact the civil war is over, and he can't get the funding. That's Isherwood's problem, really. Still interesting. Rob Minters, Shah didn't lose the Battle of Illo. Huskar escaped as night fell. If victory had been assigned, then it would be a British victory. Excuse me. I am British. I'm a Royal Navy... Uh, I, 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 I'm a naval historian. I am a Royal Navy enthusiast in many, many ways. I am regularly lambasted by people for being too pro-Royal Navy. Most of those are werewolves, and a few... What do we call the American... What are the ones who are the... Who are America always... Um, Herboos? I, I have no idea. But you cannot call it a draw if the Royal Navy at the time wasn't calling it a draw. The Royal Navy, theoretically, it might be a draw in that you get they neither side sinks. But for the Royal Navy, a draw is a loss. They expect to sink it. They expect to win. They are the Royal Navy. Anything less than a dramatic, powerful victory, a victorious success, is a loss. It's the same for America today. The trouble when you are the world's primus into Paris, first among in calls or the major power, you have to win every battle or you lose. You have to, a draw is not a win for the Royal Navy. Just mention this battle. The British did use AP. Mm -hmm. uh, about a third expenditure of Pallas and Huskar's armour was penetrated once and damaged a few times. Not really. According to Na the Royal Navy's own reports on that subject. But 
I'm not going to get into the one because there is a there. I do realize there is a debate over whether or not they're using AP shells or not, and there is a debate over the types of shells and how good you consider those in, in armor piercing roles. And some so, uh, some sources consider them armor piercing, some consider them semi armor piercing, and some consider them not armor piercing at all. So we'll get into that. We will leave that to one side. Um. Husker took casualties, and her overall damage was evaluated as extensive but superficial. You've written the Peruvians credit Husker for victory, in the same way the Argentinians celebrated the sinking of Israel. But you haven't listened to what I said as why it was considered a victory by the Royal Navy. Because the Royal Navy didn't sink her. She was damaged. Yay. She didn't sink. The British ships were damaged. She didn't sink. That is what the Royal Navy was there to do. The Royal Navy was there to sink her. It's not the same as the Argentinians celebrating the sinking of the Invincible. Because the sinking of the Invincible didn't happen. Because... The idea that the British can magically build an aircraft carrier that quickly and send it down there is just... The British would love that manufacturing capacity, so that's just no. No. But the point is, you're talking about at a period when the British are arguably reaching the height of their powers, their status. The Royal Navy is considered, um, considered the pinnacle navy in the world at this point. It is considers itself the pinnacle navy as well. Its self image is so high, it is absurd. And yet they lose. And why do they lose? Because they don't sink it. it they go in there. If they do anything less than sink the ship, it's a loss. Yes, we call it a draw. At best, you can call it a draw because both sides go away uninjured. Or rather, injured, but they go away afloat. Yes, they, the Huskar withdraws at night. But it wasn't supposed to escape. Again, that's a loss for the British. The British were there to blockade and kill it. It didn't get sunk, and it escaped them. That's a loss. The British have failed in to achieve their objectives. That is a loss. And the Royal Navy at the time acknowledged it, understood it, and learnt from it. They go into almost overboard learning from it. Between that and some of the battles which start to take place. They really do learn from it. Hmm. Right. Next video. Gra uh, general Admiral. Ah. Always good to do a General Admiral. Mm hmm. Now, let's see. Do you know, I wish I could find all the lyrics to the glorious old song, The Armour Cruiser Squadron. All I have is, oh, why, oh, why did Uncle Sam build those ships not worth a damn in the Armour Cruiser Squadron? Hmm. Anyone knows where that song is, please look it up for me. I might even sing it. I know you all love my singing. <laughs> Thoroughly confused. That name. Like the ship have been named after Admiral General Aldine. Aldine. Yes, I do know that General Admiral is a historic rank. But the more often I heard it, the more an image of Aladdin appeared. <laughs> uh, Marcus Franconian. Uh, uh, the Russian Navy. They had, they had a star that actually wanted to learn how to build a Navy. And ships even went undercover in Zandam to learn the... Uh, sh uh, sh right. And ships. And even went uncommon in Zandam to learn the trade. And then he got stuck with the Russian population while well, they're great incompetents. Eh, the Russians are people aren't incompetent. They just... They spent so long being put down... 
and so long not being support and so long not being given the access to the information the, su the stuff they need that we take for granted they are where they are I count many Russians as good friends. Honestly, at the moment, I'm having fun sometimes explaining, uh, when I ha ever have a discussion with them, sometimes explaining that the, some of the stuff they're hearing is complete and utter twaddle. But we'll leave that to one side. The Russian people are not incompetent. Their leaders often are. If there was ever a navy that was a joke or useless, it would be the Russian navy. Mmm, no. They actually produced some very interesting stuff at points. Only One of only a few victories against the Ottomans were achieved under Admiral von Kinsberg, an admiral that wrote a book and formed the basis of modern naval tactics uh, of the 1700s 1700 to 1800s. The last admiral to win a victory over the British during the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War was a smaller fleet during the American Revolution. Hmm. They, they never learned anything from Van Kingsburg. Logic, logistics, and any form of education is absent in the Russian Navy military as a whole. Mm, actually, no. The Russians often have very wonderful institutions for learning. They just they set them up, they fund them, and then they forget about them. And you see pictures come out of their accommodation blocks looking like... Well, honestly, looking like they are parts of Stalingrad under siege in World War II. Um, the lesson that you should often take from Russia and the Russian experience is that infrastructure and organization is not just something you do once. It's an ongoing activity. If you do not invest, if you do not build up these things, you won't have them. John Hargreaves, the Russian Empire has always been a threat to British and India. For at least 150 years, the Russians have always wanted everything in Asia as part of their empire. It was certainly interesting. Mainly them keep going and trying to go, and both sides keep trying to go through Afghanistan and not learning less than of Afghanistan, which was basically... Find someone you vaguely like, give them lots of weapons, and let them run Afghanistan. Don't try and get involved in yourself. And um, actually, invest in some infrastructure for Afghanistan. That'd be quite sensible. I recommend building a railway. <coughs> but I won't get into that particular rant again. Calvin Asmet, in the Cretan intervention by the International Squadron, the uh, Kriya K. Dominion also took part with the SMS Leopard 2 Pedro Cruiser, the SMS Fra K. Franz Josef, the first protected cruiser, the SMS K. and, and Konig Maria Theresa Armour Cruiser. However, when word got around of General Admiral, the KUK Cruise Marine would not panic. So this was not their habit. They would set up, set up a committee to decide when can Italy have such a vessel and what could they do with it. Furthermore, what could the KUK, uh, KUK do against it? Given the lack of interest and therefore meager naval budget, my answer wouldn't have been too different from the SMS Zara and her sisters. Hmm. Taylor tried. So Thompson. As her armor belt ended up below the waterline, does that mean she instantly had the first anti-torpedo defenses? That's a scary thought. Accidentally inventing torpedo defenses. How would she have held up to the conventional torpedoes of time? Um, Not that badly. Not brilliantly, but not that badly. For the RN, I would develop this or sent more armored cruisers to show the Russians thought they were actually supposed to look like. Um, as well as so HMS Revenge isn't so lonely in the International Squadron. To be fair, Revenge wasn't learning in the International Squadron, there are other ships there. But uh, I would add in the British armor cruisers were not always that good at the time either. They also had a habit of their belts ending up below the waterline. Uh, Lafille, Lafille Abriel, hello. As often as the Russians got things wrong in their ship designs, once in Blue Moon they got things right. Unfortunately, them building their right designs took so long that often they were already obsolete when it's ours. True. Also, it's not that much of an exaggeration to say that the Imperial Russian Navy had never built anything on time or designed a placement, and certainly not on budget. The late Stephen Makarov said it the best. We design a ship of 8,000 tons, but build one over, over 9,000 tons. Uh, should probably be about over 10,000 tons. We'll leave that to, uh, leave that to one side. Uh, what's going on, 71? Hello. I'm probably not the first point to, uh, post, uh, to post this, but Jezog equals Russian spelling of German word Herzog. Loan word. Herzog equals Duke English. The ship is literally named the Duke of Edinburgh. I know, but I'm trying to pronounce the Russian version of it. And I did point out it was named for the Duke of Edinburgh. 
20 years later, Rob Smith, hello Rob, uh, 20 years later, Tabina ran rings around the, lum lum around the lumbering giants. So that's off the list for now. Uh, so it's particularly pretty big, actually quite good looking, while looking both back and forward in time. Downside, it's only a single shaft, so let's see what's going to be done with a twin shaft hull, a little bigger, a bit faster, and at least the same range. A full centerline arrangement of main guns, 8 inch minimum, had the British got 9.2 or 10 inch by that point. I, yeah, various things of them. Uh, if not, then get going on at PDQ. Sort out the belt armor so it sits mostly above the water instead of under it. Yeah, that's going to require some effort. And make it less of a round bow, more of what would be later on known as an Atlantic bow. Hmm. 18 in Paul for Chicago. Ross Smith, pretty good. 18 in St. Paul for Chicago, 80 73, and 12 not top speed seems a little slow. This was the Russians. Sigeon 19. Hello. Belts going below the waterline is a pretty common problem for Russian built ships and British built ships and American built ships. And Adrian. J. Grand Am's the dark segment, Lord of the High Slung Bottoms of Zob. <laughs> okay. Right then. It's 50 minutes. Will I get through the comments for HMS Shannon in the next nine minutes? We will see. I will, But I think that will be the last one. So I think this will be uh, an introduction to Shannon. And then the next one will be Valesco class onwards. So this might go a little over the hour, might it? Um, I'm not going to do Quizmaster's comment because, yeah, I don't need the YouTube being upset with me. But, Gordon Smith. I'm wondering if that girl had a, a surname was by any chance Jacobs because I knew a girl in Sheffield called Shannon. Brilliant at darts, horizontal flight, and could beat scaffold as an arm wrestling. Stunning girl, looked like an angel. I have an auntie from Sheffield. Well, when I say an auntie from Sheffield, I mean my mother's second cousin's wife. I call her auntie, and frankly, that makes sense to me, because I call him uncle. Lovely. Lovely pair. They were down in Cornwall for some point. Um... And she's from Sheffield. And she is good at darts. I haven't seen her against scaffolders, but I've seen her against fishermen in arm wrestling, and she's still pretty darn good, despite being not the biggest of people, but she she can win it. And, yeah. I wouldn't want to say it looked like an angel, uh, but... Now... Let's put it this way. I I tend to have to be my family's uh, the uh, the ladies of the generation of that generation's bodyguards when they go out. You know, they're all going out on town. I tend to be designated driver, as I don't drink. And I have had to be bodyguard on more than one of occasion when there's been gentlemen going hello, Alfman. The rule is, I don't get involved unless they do the signal, which is copied from Her Majesty the Queen. They swap their handbag from one side to the other. At which point, Nephew swings in and goes, Hello! Is there a problem here? If the handbag stays in the same position they're happy with it, then I don't get involved. Just a quick tip. It's a good one to try, you know, if they don't need you to get involved, if they're happy handling the situation, that's fine. But if you have a nice, simple symbol, uh, a signal that doesn't require any shouting or anything, that's very clearly visible, handbag chasing and changing from side to side, you know exactly when to get in. And I, if it was good enough for the Queen, it's good enough for them. Nice and great for one. Buggy audio throughout. Well, I'm hoping to improve that. That's one of the reasons for the computer upgrade, so... Hopefully this will work. George Willenby, I like the series of videos. Uh, seri George Willenby, I like the series of videos. Um, thinly commented subject area, so good to hear your views. Thank you. Nice everyone. Find a way to get as much use of it uh, uh, as much use of it out of it, then send it to the scrapyard when Charles Lau. Hmm. My coach, answer your question. Wait till someone is having a war, or there is a threat of war, and people are scurrying around trying to boost their fleets, side up to one side or the other, or both, 
and in my best Arthur Daly managed to go, hey, mister, want to buy an ironclad? I like him. Shrike, audio troubles today. Yeah, but these are new audio troubles of Channel 1. First, it should be uh, regarding the question. First, it should be omitted. Secondly, it should be investigated if the investment could be recovered by assigning the vessel to a new role more, uh, as suited to a lack of qualities with minor modifications are warranted. Or maybe it could be sold or gifted to some minor ally. Uh, you're having trouble the sea keeping this fine vessel that was gifted you. Probably lack of training and proper infrastructure on your part, really. Ah, uh, yeah. Terrible singing. Anyway, John Hargroves, as to your question, the first thing I would do is ask why. John Harris, sounds like a Swiss Army cruiser designed by a committee from Matron's Pinnacle. Hmm, potentially. Uh, Quizmaster China, any new military technology goes through a time when its usefulness is uncertain due to un untested in actual combat. Current examples are the LCS, but also hypersonic missiles. For all we know, modular and extremely rapid cutter types of this ship will, with helis and special forces will prove useful in nuclear war. Too tough to spot, not worth blowing a new con, all that hypersonics will work brilliantly, or fail catastrophically. We can see this in World War II, regard the carriers, seaplanes, torpedoes for the best examples I know, but also in tanks. In a simple case, if you have untested tech that the designer and producer will promise the moon, and one day, a fine day, there will be an enemy who blow those promises to hell. True. And I would add, we hear a lot about the weapons which succeed in war. They get a lot of write-up. There are a lot of uh, weapons which didn't succeed in war. Let's be honest, the Royal, the Royal Navy was trying rocket-propelled anti-aircraft munitions at the beginning of World War II. They're known to be terrible, they are got quickly out of service. But they're trying them. If they worked, imagine how different the world, as advertised, imagine how different the world might have been. If the Royal Navy had faced the threat they were designed to take on, i.e. level-flying strategic bombers, they would have worked. The reality was, though, no one was actually going to fight that way. Despite having level bombing, strategic, level bombing strategic bombers in almost every arsenal. So they had the, everyone had those weapons, they just weren't going to use them that way on that target. Because no one thought it was sensible, other than the RAF keep trying to tell the Navy it was going to be what was going to happen. Because that would help them their budget and arguments for why the Royal Navy shouldn't get dive bombers. Um... Andrew Cox, I can't help thinking that this ship was laid out wholly around this one operation concept of ramming to the exclusion of any consideration of more general duties. Mm, the Christopher, the purpose-built ironclad round does sound like an odd way of continually popping up in the RN. It's one of those interesting things, because with HMS Shannon built like this, I was watching Drax Thunderchild video. His what, what, what he thinks Thunderchild was video. And I was listening to it and thinking, well, hang on. Shannon is also arguably built as a ram. So there's another option. She's not built with the ram, she has to have the ram fitted, but let's be honest, if Shannon had been successful, a successor class of her could have been the Thunderchild class. It's an interesting idea to think about. Gonsmith, oh dear God, not only the singing, but a Scottish accent too. I shall treat my Balvina Walker's shortbread. What's next? The Irish rebel songs? I might try them. Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. Hmm. From Glen to Glen. No, I won't be that cruel. Ah, uh, just for, I'd send a China station or somewhere for even further from you. You don't want to make the ship's failure too obvious publicly. That would should shake confidence in the Navy and make it harder to get future funding. How do we know you won't waste the money we give you on a failure like X? That would also hinder the prospects of certain officers and civil servants working for with the Navy's chance of being granted all the title upon retirement. That would create factionism and elements of the Navy actively working against each other. Admiral the Honorable Sensor made me look rather incompetent during the HMS Awful controversy. Now that his faction's in charge, we must ensure their ship, the HMS Not Great, appears to be an abject failure, since because of him, I'll never be a baronet. So clearly better for the good of service that the failings be known internally, ship quickly and quietly hidden from view before it can do anything. In three to five years, when no one responsible for the initial failure is still in the post to be embarrassed and try to make something useful from it. Potentially. Uh, Trafalgar? Maybe not Trafalgar, but Lisa. 
this is as the battle which they were due on. Now, I actually have a very a point for this. To be fair, it was both. But yeah, this is a Trafalgar style, not a Lisa style one. The idea of breaking a line, taking fire from head on as you came in, then firing as you go past, that's Trafalgar. Dreadnought is a Lisa style one. With ideas from 1866 having really taken hold in the 1880s and 1890s, the idea of six plus four guns firing forward to range as you engage. Interesting enough, you, Carl Gasper then puts on the point, go on all guns blazing and round target ship or tripod if necessary. Yeah, this is another point why I put it in as a contender for a potential forebear of HMS Thunderchild. Because it is Trafalgar style. It's charge the enemy, all guns blazing. And then engage as you go past with your other guns. It is Trafalgar style shape for Shannon. It's an interesting ship. Getting rid of a failed, basically, prototype ship always depends on who are the ones I will potentially lock horns, maybe internationally. Hmm. Anyways, actually, I didn't notice any serious audio problems. Better internet connection, perhaps? Oh, from home, we can hope. Um. Are you sure you can explain that armor? I hope I did explain that armor. It was weird. Jeffrey Plum. Even if her armor worked, where did they expect all those shell fragments just dropped on her foredeck to go? Everything ahead of that nice wall was a shell trap. Armor chosen to work only if the enemy only shoots at it isn't alone is a bad idea. They might have other fingers in mind, or they may miss your lovely armored target and hit the eggshell of the rest of your ship. Note the good doctor explored this design, sober, dry-eyed, neither laughing nor crying. There is no sign of coffee, tea, iron brew, or anything stronger. This is the mark of a true professional, someone who can factually report on their absurd criminality without liquid support. She was dead in the water on launch. It seemed the last right should have been given to her. This was not the captain. This was an admiralty design. But as hard and professional, he has seen the authorship design abused more times than he can count. Bravo, sir. Thank you. And yes, I have seen a lot worse than the Shannon. I have seen a lot worse. But you are right. It is a ship of contradictions. Paul from Chicago. During that period, I would have sent the ship off to the China station. Maybe Australia. It would look good. Possibly deal with any War of the Worlds tripods. Probably not get into too much trouble otherwise. If I got lucky, I'd insure it with Lloyd's first and put a German royal as a captain. Ooh, always fun. Wesley Phillips, with a little bit of fiddling with the long with the log, you might be able to claim that due to a storm or high sea, she sprung several leaks that gradually got out of control, hidden behind or in all those storerooms and coal bunkers up forward. So sorry she, that she foundered in deep water, but at least all the crew were taken off safely before the end. Just don't mention that it was a skeleton crew and the sea cocks were open, perhaps in a mistaken attempt to let the flooding forward drain out the bottom of ours. You could always hope. Now, Rapid Razor Man, don't laugh or I roll too hard. If I load a 9-inch shell or cannonball into a 10-inch gun and try to fire, what happens? Well, it doesn't work that well. Even with wadding and worse... Uh, with wadding. Uh, and worst case, you blow up the gun and gun crew because the shell wibbles in the barrel. Now, if it wibbles, this is, means it's sort of corkscrews into the side, locks in, and goes boom. Um, you said they didn't have shells of big guns. I thought I would ask. I can understand. Testing, uh, test firing a 9-inch gun in a 10... A 9-inch shell in a 10-inch gun is not going to be a good experience for anyone. Here's a word. Wobble, sure, but wibble. Wibble is an accentuated wobble. Basically a wobble, but worse. Wibble. It goes wobble, then wibble. In the scale of things going worse. You can have a wobble. Then you can have a wibble. And if you're really having a bad time. You can have a wobble. Now. A wobble. Is not a gentleman. From a certain cartoon series. Saying rabble. He's not saying wobble. It goes wibble wobble wobble. Basically, it's differing levels of oscillations of things in flight and how they maneuver around, uh, how they sort of start to behave badly. Wibble and wobble have made it into the English dictionary. Wobble hasn't, as far as I can see. 
Uh, there are definitions and requirements of things making the English dictionary. I only know of Wabble because of a very interesting engineering report I read in an archive. Uh, it must be about four or five years ago from this time. And it was actually how they defined shell issues in the gun. Whether they wibbled, they, uh, whether they wobbled, they wibbled, or they wabbled. So, there you go. New word for you. Wibble and wabble. Preparation. Turn it back in. Turn it into a test bed for new tech. That's always a good way of getting rid of uh, ships. And um, properly, we're now on Shannon. Correct, Murray. Lemon squeezer. If it can't it can be economically fixed, and if I have no absolute need for it, then we have a new depot accommodation ship. Commission a study to determine what went wrong in the design process and what, if anything, can be done to ensure a change it does not happen again. Cost submitting, we designed a poor vessel and taking out of service are less than the cost of having that vessel fail at sea and sink. The cost of the emission are vastly less than the damage to the reputation if the vessel fails in combat, resulting in public defeat. Firm believer in everyone makes mistakes. It is what you do to fix them and learn from them matters. True, the trouble is, politics doesn't tend to be quite so level-headed. Lafayette Brill just goes to show, even though he's proud of the RN, can occasionally also get things really wrong too. Oh, yeah. Here's the armor. Yeah. Let's go back to that. As you can see, the armor is beautifully designed to protect from forward fire and to protect things well actually it turns out below the waterline uh, but all the guns along the side they're not protected um vision actually on the question asked the u.s navy produced a lot of lemons 1816 to 1900 foremost there was the casso class light monitor fiasco where the insufficient oversight of subordinate designers at the Anclad office at the Brooklyn Navy Yard under John Erickson led to an enormous class of cheap monitors becoming overly complex monitors that were too heavy to float with a turret. Then the oversized monitor, USS Dictator, which had insufficient stowage for supplies, and then several fast supercruisers, the one upon which I expected, uh, that proved to be not so fast. The conversion of the steam frigate Roanoke into a free turreted ironclad was a failure. All these ships rusted and rotted at the dock in post-war era, still, still scrapping in the 80s of these 80s. Honestly, if I were the United States in 1881, I would have made an offer of fate from a Shannon from the Royal Navy because the US Navy had failed so badly that she would have had been as a high, as a high seas armored cruiser a good complement in a navy of wooden corvettes, gunboats, and modern ironclad monitors. If purchased, I would have first replaced the two-bladed screw, a four-bladed one, with a disconnecting gear so that the screw could turn freely under sail, a common feature of post-war war USN ships. This should have boosted her top speed under steam without adversely affecting her speed, speed under sail. Second, I would have switched out her armament, installing a unified main arm to 9 8 inch MRS or even BLRs, that's muzzle loading rifles or even breech loading rifles, converted uh, from 11 inch Dal Green smoothbore guns, as with the armament to the USS Tedron, Trenton, 1876. Given the long build times of the Texas and the Main, the purchase refit of H. Shannon would have given the US Navy at least one armored ship comparable to those of Chile, Argentina, and Brazil. That's a nice thing. I'm not sure the Royal Navy would have let them buy it. Uh, Ed Seams, what do you do with HMS Lemon? If I couldn't sell to one of the spec Navy, I'd use it for training or testing new guns. It could also be useful for harbor picket duties, fishery inspections, patrol, protected yacht, troop transport, prison hulk, or target. True. Anyway, thank you for watching. I do usually finish this off with a question, so I'm going to say for this one, as this is going to be a continuation, I'm going to continue 19th century cruisers. <coughs> Are there any other class of 19th century cruisers you'd like me to do videos on? Because it might be something I return to even next year. Next year I'm considering it to be the year of naval technology. I'm tempted to do the year of naval technology. I'm going to see about it and work it out. But, and that's what I'll be calling it, but I'll still be doing some battles, and I'll still be doing, of course, Patron, and there's a few other things, and there's possibly going to be another couple of trips coming up where I'm going to need to do more videos while I'm wandering, so I'd like to see if, um, and that's before this year, though, I'd like to see if you would like what other 19th century cruisers you might enjoy to be looked at. So suggestions, please. Thank you very much for watching, hope you enjoyed, and uh, take care.